that out now. <laughs> and I want to remind you that his company and the whole company from Cuba will be performing tomorrow up at the Hilltop Montessori School in their space at 11. See what you just heard about. Um, so to transition into our next interview, we've been interspersing what we're calling our firsts in the tradition of interviews or within the interviews so that we can continue to meld together the dialogue with the arts. Um, so in that spirit, now you guys, are they all plugged in? Can we attach? We're all somehow attached. Um, so before we have our dialogue with Kimmy and We're going to perform a little cranky for you. Yeah, not, not a person either. Yes. I, I think uh, 
Wait, so there's like, a, uh, we have a fishies. I think that's a box store. I, you know, I don't, maybe I like the first ending better. I don't know. It's just, it's Well, good afternoon, and now it's up to us three little fishies here. <laughs> Tough act to follow. I'm the former arts editor of the Brattleboro Reformer. I'm now the executive director of the Very honored and, and uh, privileged to have been asked by Sandglass to help facilitate these conversations. Uh, hopefully for uh, all of you as well. I'm here now um, today with uh, Kimi Maeda, and creator of the piece uh, Bend, which has a festival, and uh, we'll talk more about that with her. And also here with Julie Lick of Springfield, Mass., and uh, has some other projects to talk about, and we'll find out what you do as, as well. So um, our general generations and generations of we'll leave it at that and, and we'll explore that idea so maybe we could start by having folks hear about Bend and uh, how it came about and, and what you were hoping to explore and is a uh live performance piece where I do uh, sand drawing on the floor, but I have live feed video of the sand drawing, but I combine that, the projection tournament camps. Um, and sorry, what was the other question? And, and, and the, the story and then? Or um, what, yeah, uh, so the story is about my father and his experience he was nine years old when he had to go to the Japanese American internment camp in Poston, Arizona. And in the same sculptor who voluntarily went to the camp, he thought uh, it was the best way for him to help the Japanese Americans. He didn't actually have to go because he was um, based in the East Coast at the time he was in California, but he didn't, he wasn't required. Um, and And so there's a big part about memory and um, forgetting, I guess. And especially now, so many of the survivors of the internment camps are dying. Um, my dad is, is 82, so he was nine. He's 82 now. And so we're, we're losing those stories now. Thank you. Julie, a little bit about? what you do, and then we'll, we'll delve a little deeper. But. Okay, um, I collaborate with young people in Springfield, young adults um, between the ages of 15 and um, to create performances that weave together uh, personal narratives um, and themes that bring in larger systemic issues, um, but specifically the young ident identify as first generation. And we use that term to mean the first in their families to be growing up in this country, the first to be speaking English in their families. It could be the first in their families to be graduating from high school or going to college, first in their families 
not be incarcerated in several generations. The first in their families to be in their families to be a Muslim feminist. First in their family to be an artist. So really what began as immigrants and refugees expand space. will be in anywhere from five to eight languages, and we do. <laughs> if I could, um, that um, there is um, of uh, to, um, uh, and if you could talk a little bit about that, and, and maybe how. Yes. Yeah. So for me personally, um, I came into this work as an artist, but kept, um, could not get away which I look at the world, which is as the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, someone who was in France between the ages of five and 10 years old. Um, and I grew up with my, my mother's stories and really um, what, how that as an artist is that I really, I think I really um, identified, I was able to identify with oppression, oppressions um, from a very young age, um, especially racism in this country. Um, and so all the work that I strive to identify those oppressions, but also what I feel is to uh, achieve a sense of interconnectedness. Thank you. Yeah. So um, uh, for, for Kimi, I was so intrigued by um, your choosing the two stories of um, your father and Noguchi um, to, to pass through uh, Bend. If you could t uh, tell me about how that sort of came to you as, um, as uh, something and, and why you made that choice as an <laughs> stories together. Yeah, um, my father is, was an art historian and he started out studying Chinese landscape painting, but um, because that's what you did then, he, not many people were studying Japanese American or Japanese. In his career, he he did start studying Noguchi and was really fascinated by this man that he remembers seeing in the camp. Noguchi would have been in his mid 30s. My dad would have been nine, so it's not like him and his work. And book uh, and never finished it. And so, in some ways, I think of this piece as kind of what my dad started and, and try to bring some conclusion. Noguchi's life really fascinating. He's, his whole family going back and forth across from Japan to America. His mother was Irish American had an affair with this Japanese and had this baby, uh, no, Noguchi's father would have left at that point. But she made the decision to go to Japan, which is kind of a and, um, and Isamu. Isamu's dad had already formed this other family with another woman, so it, it was a very complicated <laughs> relationship. But um, but really interesting character, and then um, uh, Noguchi's father was also an interesting character. He was a poet. He went. He came to America when he was a young man, and. Um, he learned from these American poets and was writing in English, not in Japanese. 
books, actually, um, not writing in Japanese but in English. And then he went back to Japan where, well, he became famous because he was famous in America. So it's, it's this funny sort of back and forth kind of thing. And yeah, I just, and, and then Isamu's wife even was Shirley Young. But she was, um, she was actually a, a Chinese film star and then became a, a Japanese film star and was actually in American movies as well. So, but she, she had trouble after World War II because they thought, the Japanese thought she was a spy. So all of these, Noguchi's life really interesting because I also feel, or I felt growing up kind of in between two different cultures. You know, I, I grew up in New England in, Town and um, of two Asian kids in my family adopted Korean. So, um, you know, in some ways I felt like I didn't belong there, but then when my mom would take, we'd go to Japan every other summer, um, and I definitely did not belong there either. So yeah, I, I find this idea of, of being in between two different places really interesting. Thank you. Could you um, deeper into, into that uh, otherness? I, in an email, you said that you had just been at the Alternative Roots mm -hmm. um, conference, and uh, that was something that had um, sort of roiled up with you. Um, if you could just talk about uh, talk about that. Um, you know, obviously, you grew up in New England, and we yeah. would think that um, uh, that may not be something that you would deal with so much. But um. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, there weren't a lot of people that looked like me yeah. in New England. Um, uh, so yeah, it, it's it's important in my work. It's uh, do all the time, and I think that. In a way, I felt like when I was uh, growing up, like a lot of a lot of theater productions that I would see. I think that I've I've come to this place where I'm trying to create my own stories and tell uh, tell things from the way that I've I've seen things. You know, so it's. Uh, Seeing or listening to the the Mexicans the other day, I think it's what I find so great about puppetry, especially, is that through the art of puppetry. Um, hmm. So yeah. And Bend is part of a, a trilogy of, of pieces. Could you talk about the other yeah, other legs sure. of the um, stool there? The first two pieces are more shadow puppet based, and they're all they're all still about family. But the first piece is more about my mom's journey from Japan to America. She's it's funny in the Japanese American community. First generation is or Issei are the the ones who came oh. over from Japan. Oh. Um, so uh, she's Issei, mm -hmm. and uh, the second. It's more just a nostalgic piece about home and what home means, which I think struggled with a lot. Like, you know, I, I do feel very much that New England is my home, but what exactly is that? And I think, you know, for people who uh, don't different places, I think. The idea of home isn't quite as complicated, <laughs> but I think it always is actually. And I, I also <coughs> thought a lot about So you can travel a million places, but if you have a sense yeah. that can be a grounding thing. But if you've never <coughs> lived in your homeland, that can be a very Julie, could you elaborate a little bit on, on how you go about uh, your work? I have to understand you back here because the air conditioning. Okay, I'll speak up. Yep. So, if, could you elaborate on, on how you go about uh, creating your pieces with, uh, with your groups? And, um,
last piece that we we created was called, in the end, it was called Fonale, which is Haitian Creole for We Must Go. And um, it took us a little over a year to create it. Um, the group comes together in what we call our group building, skill building phase. Um, is that a good volume for you? And um, that means getting to know each other, um, building uh, trust, like in terms of um, sharing life experiences, um, learning to move together as an ensemble, and um, also learning each other's languages. And I, I mean that not just in terms of the fact that one person, we had Amharic, Spanish, English, Kirundi, Nepali in that performance. <laughs> um, so not just those languages, but also just the ways that people communicate um, beyond that language. Um, so that was the first three or four months. And then we start looking, uh, we start, based on the stories that people are telling and the themes that they're bringing to the group, we start developing um, text and movement. and a lot of exercises and a lot of thinking. So for example, for Fonale, um, I used two jumping off points, departure points. One was a question I always ask the youth that I'm working with, which is, if you have an hour to speak to the world, what would you want to say? And I, I do that because I want us to go deep right away. I, I want to dispel any idea that we're going to be doing entertainment. What's the most important thing that you could possibly say? So that's a long brainstorm and a long conversation. And then I add on to that because you have knowledge that nobody else has because nobody else has lived your life or walked in your shoes. So based on your life experience, what knowledge or questions might you want to share with the world? The second big departure point for Fonale was they were leaving their homeland or when they left their homeland. And it couldn't be documents or photographs or writing. It couldn't be flat. <laughs> um, and, and why? What's the story that opened a lot of doors for stories? Um, with the kids who were born and raised in, in Springfield, we define journey as going from here to there, perhaps emotionally. Um, as in your life, <clears throat> explain to the group what there to here was and what here to the next place. Um, and so for some people, it was a journey from a uh, Tanzania to the U.S. or a journey from, you know, informed by, I mean, triggered by the Rwandan genocide, triggered by the Bhutanese ethnic cleansing, um, or for some people it was a journey to live in one apartment for more than six months or a year, or um, going from a sense of deep disconnection to the lack of parents. Um, so the objects brought us into these stories. And um, then we work physically with the objects. We write about them. We um, and a lot of times, it's the initial skills that are already in the group, like somebody might be an incredible singer, an incredible writer, an incredible mover. Those are all, we use those as the, the paint, the palette, in a sense. Um, and then after, oh, I interview everyone. So that's how the text comes together, either through writing, improvisation, that gets videotaped and transcribed, or um, 
And there was one last interesting process that I've been working with. Um, so many of the people that I work with, they, their English, they might just be coming the last four to six months in this country. So for instance, Gita and Deepika, really one of our shows, but I really wanted them to have It was a very funny interaction. So I said, well, I'm going to ask you questions. And Stand me, and I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> I'm going to audio tape you I because that's the three English words that you can say. So in Nepal, so I got this interview that I really didn't understand at all, and I gave it to a. They transcribed it and translated it into English. I edited the English, gave it back edited version back into Nepali. And then I had the English and the Nepali Arabic, and we've done the same thing with Kurundi. So the scripts come together like that. <laughs> After, and I'm a, my background is in visual art. So after we have a script, it's sequence on it or something like that <laughs> and we go into rehearsal and that's how our pieces come together. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate a little bit on um, your work having people tell you about objects because you gave a couple of examples when we talked and that really uh, was very helpful to me to understand and what these objects might be. Um, so for example in Fonale uh, this young woman, Wize, her object was a tree. And so we used a tree in the performance. Um, and it was because um, growing up, she would always go to this one tree when um, she wasn't feeling good, when she got yelled at or was feeling years old. Um, this is you know, in the refugee camp. So that, that was one of the objects. Um, one of the most pivotal objects, I would say, in, the, in Fonale was the water tap. Um, because Gita from Nepal identified the water tap as the place where if she could go back to anywhere, any one spot in Nepal, it would be the water tap. Because the whole community gathered twice a day to get water. And they would get on line, long lines, and argue about who was first and who was cheating to skip ahead. And it was where they would get the news of who was leaving for America or Australia or who was getting married or who had died. And people would do each other's hair. And they would, the kids would be running around and playing. And the old people would be <laughs> taking care of people. And the water tap became the metaphor for the whole piece in that that place connected um, the group, the, the, the community. And so we, also, we acknowledged at that moment that everyone who was coming to Springfield from other countries lost that and couldn't find it in Springfield. They couldn't find a water tap. Because especially if you're coming from a warm country in the winter in Springfield, nobody goes out. And they're used to living with their neighbors and seeing each other every day. side of Springfield or maybe in Australia or in Canada. So for us, we acknowledge that first generation was becoming a water tap for us and that that's something that is lost in the, tran in the transition from other communities and cultures. But we also then began to explore water as a theme. And so later on in the piece, when we were looking for part of Wize's story, which was that when she came to this country at 10, nobody told her that there was a different language. There was such a thing as a different language. She went to school. There was no translator. And she didn't anybody. It was really traumatic um, until one teacher began to sit down with her. And somehow, I mean, it almost sounded like a Helen Keller situation because no on. So in our piece, 
there's this one scene towards the end where she's running around looking for water and everyone in the, it's like a Tower of Babel, everyone in the, in the community is speaking a different language and nobody can understand her. But they, they pull these objects throughout that show. So, so Fon Ale is a journey and it branches off into different stories but everybody is on the same journey and they're moving with their objects in, in the piece. Thank you. Yeah. What observations have you gleaned about uh, their experience of otherness? What, how, how does otherness make them feel? Um, that, that kind of thing. What are you observing from them about uh, what's, what's going on with them uh, mm -hmm. because of otherness? It's really, um, well, in Springfield, we have bigger populations of people from around the world. So in Springfield, um, Springfield was, you know, primarily African American and Latin. And so, um, and not good relationships between those groups. In fact, I think it was in the New York Times a couple of years ago that it was country. Um, <laughs> so um, there's a lot of beef in Springfield on all levels. Um, politics, about princi which principles can control a particular school district, it's really sad really sad. And then, of course, those are the models that the young people go by. So um, when the Nepali youth start coming into the city, or the Guatemala, the African youth from Somalia, Sudan, Burundi, Tanzania, they are really isolated. Um, so they experience a tremendous amount of isolation or otherness. Um, in the sense, especially with the African kids, because the African American youth very often want to separate themselves from them and say, you know, ha, you're, you know, a lot of slurs. Mm -hmm. On the other end of things, a lot of the African kids are like, well, I'm not African American. You know, I have a much better ancestry than you. I have an intact family. You know, there's a lot of observation on the part of the refugee and immigrant kids about what's going on in the, the people living in poverty in Springfield. So there's a lot of Nepali kids. Everyone thinks they're Latino. <laughs> um, so it's just, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing situation. And then when we come to first generation, um, we have an opening ritual, which is a, a welcome that is. So we've made sure that in terms of creating a space where, with some rebalancing, as we say, of the, of the priorities. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. One of the things that has struck me in the um, how a, a very simple medium or m material can uh, be used to make so a very powerful artistic statement. When we talked with the uh, Mexican artists, they work in paper uh, because it's a common everyday material and they hope that they can put it voice, very powerful. Uh, on the same panel, uh, we had an activist who helps uh, migrants who have uh, come over and are struggling to get across the desert. And, um, you know, the most to help them survive. And I, I began thinking of her as an artist who works in water to a certain extent. And we heard from uh, the Cubans today how they fashioned one uh, 20 foot skein of blue fabric in and uh, Kimmy you work in sand another very basic elemental medium which is then used to uh, create some very powerful and beautiful images and could you tell me about in it and um, uh, the power of the impermanence of it I think and, and uh, how that's used in band so talk a little bit about that 
Um, I'm not inventing anything new. I, I did see there are some really amazing sand artists. Uh, if you ever look up Ukraine's Got Talent, there's mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, I've seen other people do it. Um, and a few years ago, I was commissioned by the Southern Foodways Alliance, which is an amazing organization, by the way, um, to do a, do a piece celebrating barbecue pit masters. <laughs> and the motion of salting a pig, I thought, uh, looked a lot like sand. And so we created a, a light box and a sand table, and I, I was doing that with a partner. Um, but I, really, I found that I really liked the meat again in another piece and then for this piece I thought it, it fit uh, just because the sand and also because it relates to the land so it just seemed really fitting I think I've done a few workshops It's, it's a great medium. I think it encourages people to experiment because it's not permanent, and I think it's really forgiving in that app to try things, and it's more, it's less about them creating pretty pictures and more about them being able to tell stories. Medium to use. What? What, do you hope, what kind of feedback do you hope to get from them or what they might carry with them afterward? Um, it's been interesting doing the piece for different people. Some people will relate more to the, the Japanese American aspect of it. Um, and I think having people be able to and having them be able to relate emotionally to it uh, or just learn the history. That's also been an important thing. I think some people have come in Arkansas, and some people were saying that they didn't, they never learned this in school. So it tell the story so that people know what happened. Has yeah. is, is there been a, a particularly moving, um, particular interaction? that you could share a story that maybe someone brought to you or, or uh. um, it's it, it was great doing the show for my dad's colleagues we did it up in at Brandeis University wow. um, so there were people in the audience from people that my dad had worked with in the past and they were able to see it and my dad's colleagues were able to see it and there are some photos in the piece of those people, or their voices are actually in the in mm -hmm. the piece. So it, it was it was nice to do it for people who had a relationship to my father, and so they I think they had a a unique experience with with the piece. Feel, or how does it make you feel when you encounter people who had never heard of this chapter in history? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess it, 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 I'm just glad that I'm able to tell the story, but yeah, I, I, wish, I wish it were a little bit more well known. I guess a little bit surprised and yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And Julie, talk about um, outcomes or movements that might come from, from the work that you do. Um, what do you hope? Uh, your groups accomplish, and, and both as groups and, and, um, and audiences. I think, I think you're, in some ways you, um, those are equal, equal partners, uh, but especially. Well, the, we, the first generation uh, vision or mission, the, the performing piece and the as equal weight as the social justice piece. And for us, social justice is um, not just in the themes that we're asking people to think about, but it's also in um, creating a space, a group in Springfield of peer mentors who are 
mentors to other youth within the, and also within their communities. And these work together, and then sometimes they work at odds with each other. Um, so we're, we're always doing uh, leadership trainings. Our youth are learning how to facilitate circles. And they are, you know, taking workshops in, on, around many social justice issues and becoming, you know, hoping to facilitate that and pass it on. So, there, so there's that piece. But at the same time, um, when we perform a high school recitals, we get access to college campuses and theater festivals. And then our youth are on college campuses and they start to feel like they belong there. And that's incredible. So like Sabrina Hamilton has, you know, we're partners now with her. They live on Amherst College campus when we do that for a week. Some of them never leave Springfield otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, or some of them never leave since they got there, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, but we've also been invited to perform at another festival in Albuquerque, and we perform at Hampshire and UMass. So they, they get to know the local colleges. We just had um, a young woman who was to be raised by family, had an extremely traumatic life, came back to the States and lived in Springfield. She just got a full scholarship to Hampshire College. And she had like um, social justice to me, <laughs> you know, it really does. Social justice isn't just issues and, and, and theoretical, it's on the ground change. The world, you know, so yeah, that's, um, but in terms of audiences and performances, the most powerful experience the stories and realize you know, people say, well, why don't you tell your story to me mm. about your ancestry, your family experience, and I feel like I am telling my story. Mm. And I, that's, what I, that's what I want people to get, you know? It's, it's that, that's, that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I, I think, um, an earlier chapter for you, but could you tell us about your work in prisons, which I think in some ways was was a seed of this. Yeah. yeah. So that was like the 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 unknown to me. It was like the trigger. I had I don't have a formal theater background. I have I studied physical theater and then I went to school for visual art. And when I was living in Connecticut, I was hired to teach a drawing and painting class in a prison, in a big prison. The day that I walked into that prison, I think a little switch was flipped in my mind, and I just saw a concentration camp. I couldn't help it. Mm -hmm. And without knowing it, I had a full analysis. went down with our prison industrial complex. This was in the early 90s. I just got it on a gut level, but then of course I had to educate myself as to what was really going on. <laughs> um, so that drawing and painting class, which I was paid to do for about 20 weeks, um, ended up evolving into a theater project, which I worked on with um, a friend called Boom Theater, which went for about four years in Carl Robinson in Enfield, Connecticut. And so we, in, we kind of invented together a process to create. And a lot of the guys there were locked up for like 30 years sentence. It was a really, it was a real collaboration um, that went on for quite a few years. And then I continued to do that in the Hampshire jail. Um, and we started, I, well, not with Elsa, but So that work, um, I think understanding the potential for creating community through artistic process and also creating opportunity for stories to be told that work. That early work is what really inf informed me 
about that. And also understanding the connection slowly but surely of my own ancestry. Hmm. I think now I'm almost in, like I'm studying diaspora. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, there's something so powerful for me meeting someone who's just arrived in the United States who, and now it's on the news. Allowed to, to get in and not being allowed to leave. But when First Generation started in 2008, I remember being, feeling so honored to witness um, a family's first six months or a year in this country because I was getting fresh eyes. United States and the way someone has to kind of deal with the systems here and navigate and how they're perceived and seen. In first generation, there's a lot of really interesting conversation about why the African American students or young people, Nepali kids and the Sudanese kids, even though they You know, we're there, you know, or two centuries or whatever it is, into their diaspora and didn't come. They have to. But when, the, when Africans came here as slaves, it was, you know, it was a much worse case scenario and continued to be. So we. Um, the Nepali families or the Sudanese families are all, the education is just like rolling forward. People own a car within a year. Um, you know, they're all enrolled in community college or four-year colleges and it makes for really interesting conversations. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Kimmy, could you expand a little? We haven't explored um, dementia in your work and just what um, that and, and um, it, its importance to the work? Um, so my, my dad's form of dementia has take, is been so much that he's forgetting names and things, although that's part of it. It's been that he's had, he has a lot of delusions about things that are happening. This confusion about what's real and what's not real has been very interesting and, and frightening. <laughs> Um, but yeah, especially with the piece, it was really interesting. He kept thinking or a radio program or a TV program. They were all about him and he didn't know why, but he would think, oh, it's, it's happening next week or it's, you know, it's on Broadway. He would think that I'd um, yeah, so it was, you know, thinking about him and his childhood. and sort of escaping into the movies. And so this seemed in a way like his way of escape. So yeah, the, con the confusion aspect I think was, was interesting in the way that the sand is able to transform from one image to another, I think kind of reflects that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and also I guess this is sort of a as a young kid, um, in the piece I show this Three Stooges clip, but thinking that um, there, are, there were these really racist things going on that he was probably seeing. He talks about how he, you know, he would watch these westerns, like you know, cowboys and Indians, identifying as the cowboy or the Indian. Um, you know, so yeah, all of those things are interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I think now might be a good time to open up to some questions, so I'd be happy to entertain some questions. Anybody? Uh, Julie, it was very interesting to hear about this engagement of these young people to come to their own sense of themselves and wholeness, their healing, their empowerment. but. How does this first generation project also 
they affected? Mm -hmm. and, and tell that part of the story. Well, it's never enough. You know, like we just, I always, there, I have so many ideas of what I'd like to do. Um, what we do do <laughs> is, um, events um, at least four or five times a year where these are different from our performance and we invite families to come and maybe they have a story that they want to tell or something that they want to you know something that they want to share um, and and also we have other performers that come and first gen youth perform so that's one way that people participate in But they do get to know me um, because I often interview parents and grandparents as part of the artistic process, um, or Wize's mom's voice is singing in one of our shows, and <laughs> our shows. So they they know us as like a safe place where their kids can go because the, I, you know, they we go away sometimes for three or four days or a week to co and it's the only time that this is with us sometimes. So it's a huge trust thing that develops. Um, I think they see us as a resource for their, their children. They recognize that we're going to help them get to college. Um, they recognize that we can be an advocate for them. Actually, if they, you know, if they're having trouble with the food stamp thing or a, a court date, we're a resource um, in that sense. Medical, uh, like doctor's appointments, um, navigating mass health and Medicare and Medicaid, and it's just stop shopping or we can refer people. So they, they definitely see us as a resource and it's a rare thing because you have to spend two hours on hold, but with us, you know, it's by cell phone, so. <laughs> it's, a, it's an extended family. What we would like to do more of is some um, support, support communities to establish cultural tradition, their cultural tradition. Some Burundi dancers to like rehearse in our space. We, so we, we collaborated for the first, this is where I got like all choked up. Because our first time challenge of a first generation identity. You know, the challenge is a lot of them end up in school and want to be American and throw it all out the window. And that really is a tremendous loss. Um, you know, we, we know what it means to suddenly <laughs> be white and not have any culture, <laughs> right? It's, it's a loss. So First Generation started to say, how can you be a young person, be ancestry, your culture, your language? So when the Nepali community wanted to have a cultural festival, we help them rent the space, rent the school, auditorium, you know, deal with printing flyers, like stuff that they didn't know how to do yet. So that's, that's a way, but we really, I would want to do so much more of that. So those little things, there's a, uh, one of the Ethiopian families, um, the woman wants to open her and Someone does hair braiding. We made hair braiding business cards. So it's, it's kind of like all over the place. A little bit here, a little bit there. <laughs> yes, Michael. Wonderful. Um, and I, I was interested in the combination of what seemed to be a really genius process at the same time. And I wondered if you could say something about that. Yes, I don't. <laughs> I never really thought of the pieces spontaneous. Well, I, I guess yeah, because I'm drawing In live. Sense, drawing yeah. Ways, you know, yeah. Ways, like detours, and I mean, maybe there are. Maybe 
Um, I mean, I've I've practiced those drawings over and over and over. So I'm the marks that I'm making are are pretty choreographed, <laughs> um, but which which I think is necessary, you know, and and. As much as I do practice it, I'm not a machine, so it does change from, from performance to performance. Um, and again, this isn't quite relating to your question, but I, I was uh, really struck by this. I don't know if you listen to radio. I did a, a piece about memory, I think, I guess a year and a half or two years ago, where they were talking about but that experiment where they were actually able to in rap, it, it, it's a little complicated, but, um, but it, yeah, this idea of memory is this idea that uh, storytelling and me doing these drawings for you is a way of you guys creative thing. Um, so yeah, kind of answering your question, but not really. Yes. I mean, I'm wondering if you can project yourself in the future and just imagine a time when you're done performing band or that you're taking a pause or what, and, and then thinking of the sand that's been holding your family's stories. <laughs> um. I'm not that precious with it, you know? I mean, it's it's a material, and I think a lot of letting go and, and um, being able to let go of things and let go of the drawings. And so I think it is just sand that I bought at Home Depot. <laughs> whether I, you know, I'm, I, I'm going to make a videotape of the show and I think actually while there is a video just for archival purposes, I don't, I don't really want there to be a video of the piece that I share with people because I think it's important that it's something that is somehow. Kim, yeah. yeah. questions for you. Um, I assume part of your otherness quandary has to do with wanting people to understand something, either about you, your culture, your father, um, the internment camp. And you're obviously not first generation, as Julie's spoken about, but I just wonder along the way in your life, with your family as one of the places, whatever Japanese heritage you have, um, whether there's places within your family or educational or people you meet where on to. Do you want to hold on to? It kind of goes all over the place, but you'll find a way. Culture <laughs> has been really important to me in my life. That's been a big issue for me. Um, but yeah, we used to go to school and middle school. <laughs> but uh, nostalgia for me, so this do it memories, but I don't belong there, you know, and so that growing up, this isn't quite answering your question, but um, doing so well economically and Japanese people were coming and buying so much real estate and so and you know you'd watch movies from that time period and they were you know the the Japanese tourists right mm -hmm. and I think when I was growing up I really wanted actually cameras and like taking pictures with cameras has always been this uh, Ha has a lot of weight to it for me, you know, which I think other people don't. So yeah, it's it's uh, 
yeah, Japan's very, very much a part of my life, but at the same time, it's, yeah. But that aspect in which something very specific, uh, socially specific, like dementia or like um, uh, isolation because of two languages not being able to, to share words, uh, becomes metaphorical for culture as a whole, right? And that dementia uh, is, is, a, is a concrete in your family, in your father, and we all have the potential dementia of, of forgetting where we come from, forgetting our history, uh, of, of not as individuals, but as, as, as an entire culture. speaking different languages right. and, and what is lost by that. And, and so my question is, to create work recognizes the, the breadth of those metaphors, or is that your work, or is that our work as the audience to see that? Um. Can you repeat the question? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really interesting. I want the piece to work on those those much larger um, levels. I guess also in in terms of dementia, I you know because it's taking someone that is really familiar and making them strange to you and making you strange to them, you know? And, and so in a way, I think it's, it's a way for people to understand otherness, actually. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's... Uh, and, um, and when we met, you talked about uh, Eric N and his, his Um, this piece bend and I was feeling a little stuck it was feeling a little bit too much like I was just relating things that were happening and um, I was so struck by about these very concrete historical things that had happened these genocides and yet he was able to use this really poetic language and I thought you know, that's what I needed. I needed to like, oh, I've got to tell it the way it happens, the way it was. But you know, actually, if you if you do open it up to this poetic language, you're you're opening up the experience to to people in a in a very different way. And I think a a way where some people can enter it, um, you know, where they might. Um, I haven't so much thought about the dementia. I saw your show, your puppet show. Um, but I have been, I a, like the blurb about Fonale, one of the things that I tried to capture was the idea that experiences and if we then tell a sto the story or put them in, they become crystallized in a certain way. Um, whether the experience is, is good or bad, it, it takes on a life. And these moments, and, and memory is that you tell this, it as a story, I think we carry our memories with us and they, they inform us in terms of who they are. They can be, or they can be sources of strength and fuel us and empower 
is, for me, I, it's really um, you can change the way that the, that memory um, informs our life. Is, is is an interpretation in and of itself, right? It's. <laughs> Um, in, in the work that, that I, that I might or touching upon all these things, but it's really, it, the, the, I don't know what I'm trying to say. It's, it's, I, I think it's to, to, ha to make their own story about it or get what they get about it. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That didn't really answer your question. Yes, ma'am. There's a yeah. that Radio Lab piece. Profiles, <clears throat> working with them and then redepositing them, having been changed. Change is not only a change that happens to the memory but it's also a change that happens within the person as the memory. Right. And, and the, the, for me, the interest also on the individual level um, grows in truth and reconciliation. Yeah. You, as a, as a people, bring forth things that have been buried hidden, covered with dust, and they forms everyone who hears them, everyone who shares them, and that becomes a collective memory. Mm -hmm. and, and the telling of that collective memory in it is a, can be a very healing and very magical thing. And it doesn't always work, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but it, I'm hearing um, connections between the two of you. That human beings uniquely um, share. I think elephants also do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to say, for those of us who love elephants. I was just talking about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That, but they live longer. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Adult, fruit flies do not do it. That I know. Yeah. They, they their lives are too short. Yeah. But we're but supposed we, to be doing it. Yeah, we're supposed <laughs> to be, yeah. that's our job. Yeah. So, so in some ways, losing with it and are able not so much to let it go, but to have worked it through, so that it is like the sand, mm. and then the sand is just. I just came back from Rwanda yeah. and was just, uh, I was learning about um, reconciliation. A, a Jewish person who doesn't walk around hearing about the Holocaust on, you know, on a daily basis here <laughs> in the U.S., no. but, it, but it's the lens that's really comfortable for me, I learned so much. And I, you couldn't have a single conversation with someone without the reconciliation and the genocide being part of it. And based violence work, all their family work, all their community work is all inclusive, including peace work um, and reconciliation. And it's, we have a lot, a lot there, yeah. Uh, I think uh, we have time maybe for one more um, question. And if, uh, if I don't. If you could share some more experiences of the people that actually have gone through your program and just how you've seen things change for them or the people that witnessed it. Mm. Um, mm. Um, I've been watching people grow up, you know, for a few years. A couple interactions that I can think of. 
are um, like in hunger, um, who was in Fonale, who never really had his father or his mother growing up. Um, um, it was a very scary piece for him to share. It was a very raw cry. And um, he, he actually would like, sh not but afterwards, audience, some men would come up to him and say, thank you, um, because I've never talked about how much I wanted to be held by my father. Um, I was never able to say that. But he was not alone, and it was also a great moment for the audience, you know, to, to connect with it like that. Um, that, well, in particular, Jamari, who um, in Ripple Effect, this other piece that we did, he told the story of um, losing friends to, uh, in, to, who became child soldiers. Mm -hmm. by the, um, the army that enticed them by offering them money and then would um, give them guns, tell them to shoot someone who had a bag over their head, and what their parents. And from that point on, the child is, um, has nothing to lose. And they become, you know, the, uh, that's how they train their child soldiers, or one of their ways. Mm. And Jamari, um, told that story and we had really interesting conversations in the group about what forms of growing up there who joined gangs, because we've had gang members in first gen as well, and what are the moments in their lives where they felt they had nothing to lose. So these I had one crazy situation <laughs> where there was one guy who came into the ensemble and he, was, he had been incarcerated, he was young, he was like 17, and he had kind of one foot in each world, and he came up to co with us, spent four days, and then he said he had to go back to Springfield. Back to Springfield, we got together, and it turned out that he had realized that he had robbed one of our members. Um, and so there was this, you know, This guy said to this guy, I realized when you were talking about getting robbed, because Bush had been robbed and it had been a very traumatic experience and he was still recovering from it. He had been in a car accident and been robbed in one year. So he was talking about that. The other guy had realized it. So he came to him and he was like, I love you guys. Forgive me, I've never, I've never had to confront one of my victims. It was like, and we were all crying. So that's another example, <laughs> I guess. I want to thank all of you for being so engaged and being here. So well, thank you. Thank you.